Let's see. We can see the thing. That's in the night order. Everyone free range. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have never had a, a uh, session slide at any OpenStack Summit that is this early in the schedule. So rushing out of the keynotes and into here, it's, it's kind of fun. So this whole session is about m meeting a lot of the people who are involved with OpenStack Swift. So we've kind of set this up with a panel style discussion. I've got a few questions that I want to go over with uh, people here, let them share their thoughts. I will allow them to introduce themselves uh, momentarily. My name is John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for uh, Swift. I've been around uh, in Swift since since it began. And uh, it's been a really fun five years uh, working on Swift in OpenStack. Uh, but to get things started, uh, can you please introduce yourselves? Who are you? Where do you work? And then we'll get into some of the other questions. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Luce. I'm a principal engineer at Intel. I've uh, been working with Swift for about two years, I guess. I've um, been on the core team for about a year. And uh, I'll pass it on to Matthew. As Paul said, uh, I'm Matthew. I'm Australian. I apologize. Um, I work at, for Rackspace in their private cloud area. Uh, and I'm probably, I'm new to being a core, so I'm the whipping boy. <laughs> My name is Clay Gerard. I work at Swift Stack. I've been a Swift core contributor uh, for a while. I have. Hi. My name is Kota Suzaki. I'm working for NTT in Japan. And so I, uh, I'm working uh, for, six, for about three years, but uh, just only me, uh, not core team. <laughs> India. Hey, my name is Christian Schweder. I'm working for Red Hat as a principal software engineer. I'm based in Hamburg, Germany, working on Swift like two and a half years now and been a core reviewer since one year from now. Hi, I'm Alistair Coles. I'm with HP uh, in our Helion engineering team. I'm based in the UK. Uh, I guess I've been working on Swift for around about two years. And for the last year, I've been a core reviewer. Thank you. Uh, so the way we've kind of structured this, we've got some questions uh, that I'm going to go through. Uh, not everybody will answer every single question, and then we'll try to save a few minutes at the end so that if you have questions for any of us, feel free to ask them, see what's going on, uh, whatever, whatever happens to be on your mind. So to start with, uh, what, is, uh, what, do you, what do you like working uh, about, let's see, uh, what do you like working on in the Swift community, and how'd you get involved? Okay, I might as well start. So I got involved in Swift like two and a half years ago. Um, at that time, I was looking for a feature that was missing in Swift, so I started digging into the code. Um, developing that sweet feature. Did we manage to merge it? Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> happily. And uh, it was very helpful, the community was very helpful uh, getting this merged, uh, it was really great. And happily I was uh, able to continue my work on Swift afterwards. So what I really like in the community is um, the diversity. Um, so we have a lot of companies in the community, we have really helpful people, um, we have a lot of expertise I think. And uh, it's, it's amazing to work with this community. I mean, if you just look at the Erasure coding stuff that happened just in the last few months, it's amazing what happened. We were developing like 24 hours a day across the globe with different teams. That was great. Yeah, OK. Uh, I got started in Swift in a bit of a different way. I was at, I think, the Atlanta Summit, uh, kind of checking out um, checking out OpenStack stuff. I happened to wander into one of the design sessions for Swift, and these guys were awesome. And so I started helping out, and started doing code reviews, and it was just, you know, it was just very inclusive. It was, a, it was an amazing team. What kind of stuff do you like to work on in the project? Like, are you, like, really interested in, hey, let's figure out how we solve these API problems, or let's figure out how we deal with file systems, or any, like, some of the technical bits? I'll continue talking, because I'm here. <laughs> um, I guess, f for me, I started off doing a lot more code reviews uh, because that was kind of needed and it was really interesting to kind of really get my hands dirty in the code and see how people did things. Um, and then I s somehow put up my hand to do container sharding and now that's what I'm trying to do. It's a big problem, so hopefully I'll solve it. For those who don't know, container sharding is figure out how to scale container listings so that you can have like 50 billion objects in one particular container inside of Swift. 
Yeah, so I was going to say one of the things I... Hopefully it wouldn't be just one container, but a set of containers that acts as a single namespace. Yeah. Matt will figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's the plan. Let's not have a working session right now. <laughs> I, I was going to add that, that one of the things I enjoyed about joining in and working with Swift is it's actually um, pretty stable and, and decent code base there when I joined, which is really great to work with. But at the same time, there's, um, there's been plenty of opportunity to actually... Uh, do some creative, innovative stuff to add to that. And I think we have a bunch more stuff coming too in the future that we're already getting, kind of getting excited about. Um, and that's been really great. And just, just to add again, you know, the community is, is diverse and it's getting more diverse. And I really enjoy that. And every, every day I learn something from the other members of the community that I'm working with, which is cool. So when you're, when you're getting involved in your day-to-day -day work, how do you figure out what to work on inside of Swift? Can't work? Yeah. No, well, how do you figure out what to work on? Like, uh, it's Monday. What am I going to do today? <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm working. Oh, okay. Coffee. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, so I'm uh, working with uh, coffee. <laughs> so uh, maybe uh, I'm working on uh, Japanese time zone. Uh, so uh, just uh, the first time, first, uh, so I'm. Uh, Open uh, IRC client with talking about uh, Bayer guys, and next I'm uh, coding and working for uh, many stuff of uh, Swift, and then uh, working uh, with European guys to talk about uh, talk uh, about uh, a lot of features in Swift. I think. What are some of the? Th oh, go ahead, Clay. What? So I want to talk about how we figure out what to work on because uh, Coda mentioned one of the really important things is that we all get in our OpenStack IRC channel, OpenStack Swift. Uh, so I'd like to encourage, especially for new contributors, one of the biggest things, you know, everybody was talking about community when we were talking about this and being, being coming up to that community and being a part of that is a, the most important thing to get involved. If you're available, if you have a patch up that's really important to you and you're available for, for people to ask questions and get a hold of you, uh, then we're a really engaging uh, group of folks. Uh, so I tend to like go and look at patches that are older, maybe that somebody hasn't looked at in a while. Um, you know, I think uh, we do tend to avoid patches that have a, a negative feedback. So if myself or Alistair comes along and says, you know, this patch is great, I appreciate what you're doing, these things need to be changed, and, he, and there's a minus one on there, all you have to do to clear that minus one is push up a new change. You know, it can be update the commit message, uh, fix something. If you're not clear on what the core contributor is asking you to change, if you're not unsure you're about those review results, uh, find them in the IRC channel and demand that they explain to you potentially with the code diff exactly what it is that I need to fix in order to get this going. And, and that iterative process is, is going to help uh, those new contributors get in. Yeah, or wait long enough and Clay will just rewrite it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or, or merge it behind me and then I'll have to go back and clean it up. That, that, no, that, so, you know, so one, one of the things other than the day-to-day -day tactical stuff as far as what we decide to work on, I think that's probably pretty clear, right? Most people have their day-to-day kind of goals and their open patches and things they're looking at. But I think what's really cool about the community is how we look at the bigger fish items, the longer-term aspects. And we've got several different specs right now uh, that are all open, a lot of really cool big projects. And it really is, I think every company has a slightly different reason for participating in the community. And, and John does a really good job of helping us prioritize these and making sure that each one is really a win-win for our contribution as well as for Swift and the operators. So I think it works out really well. Yeah, I, I agree with what you guys have been saying. And for me, when it comes to reviewing, I've always got an eye on uh, the topics that we have agreed specs for, um, the topics that we've discussed either in working sessions here or when we have our mid-cycle face-to-face meetings, which, by the way, are, are great. I think. I don't know, somebody, maybe it's Clay, characterized them as coffee, meat, argue, repeat. Um, <laughs> but they are so productive in terms of getting the community on the same page and understanding where we're trying to go with new features that people are bringing. So as a reviewer, that's, that's one answer to how do I decide to work, what to work on. And, and, and stuff that just annoys me that I want to see fixed. Um, as a developer, then I'm looking at what my customers are feeding back they want to see uh, going into Swift. If you're, sorry, if you're a new contributor and you, or you want to find something to work on, then we've also got the Swift uh, wiki pages, and there's an actual page there called like Swift Items or whatever it's... Ideas. Ideas, there you go. Thanks, PTL. Uh, <laughs> Swift Ideas, there are some, some kind of things you can start to take a look at or take a bite out of for those who don't have anything. Usually, like uh, Alistair said, 
it also comes from our customers too. Uh, it propagates up to us. Yeah, and if you're a new contributor, um, we have from time to time low-hanging fruits. So these are, these are simple fixes that we don't do on ourselves, but um, which are really easy to fix and should get you started to, to get into the community. Cool, thanks. So a lot of things have been said like, oh, well, there's these new features coming up and things like that. So what are some of the recent things in Swift that you're really excited about uh, that have already landed inside of Swift? What, what isn't exciting about the new recent yeah. features, right? That, that's a good question. <laughs> so, I mean, they're, they're all just awesome. In, in fact, I, I got involved with Swift two years ago, um, specifically for erasure codes, right? We wanted to, we wanted to see that happen. And, um, yeah, so I just couldn't be happier at, uh, at how it's all come together, and we've got the beta in Kilo. But before that, right, it was storage policies that John and I talked about on stage in Atlanta. Um, and, and that was really just a just tremendous foundation for extensibility, not only for erasure codes, but for just all sorts of other things. Um, and in fact, there were multiple talks uh, in Paris, and I think, what do we have, 19 talks this time that have Swift in the title, if you go count them. It's just, the, the popularity is, is just nuts. It's great to be a part of the community, and, and features like storage policies and erasure code and container sharding and encryption, and the, the list just goes on and on, but they're all awesome. Yeah, uh, I was very really happy to see uh, the issue called Landit in the Kilo release. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the reason uh, I worked uh, on the EC calls. So, uh, so our company just published uh, an announcement to pluggable Elijah Code backend uh, for OpenStack Swift uh, yesterday evening. So uh, it's really good, and so. Yeah, I saw that. So a brand new backend that you can put into the pluggable erasure code backends for Swift that yes. not only does the erasure codes, but also does like secure secret, like yeah. encrypting the erasure coded pieces. Like, like. And that's really cool. What is it called? Like uh, SS? HSS. -S -S uh, super high speed secret sharing. <laughs> <laughs> super high speed secret sa sharing. So SHSS. -S. Anyway, yeah. so that was really cool. I saw that this morning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm... Uh, I'm very happy to uh, land my patch for global cluster. <laughs> oh, yeah, the global cluster improvements, yeah. those were great, yeah. yeah. So, uh, in the half year, uh, I'm really uh, good uh, activity uh, for OpenStack Swift, I think. So, apart from erasure codes and global replication improvements, another thing we uh, landed for Kilo was um, support for something called service tokens. And I think that's worth mentioning um, because it's a really good example of um, working with some of the other projects in OpenStack. So uh, without going into the detail, it's just a way in which um, the Keystone auth uh, middleware will accept two tokens and validate both of those tokens uh, before uh, authorizing a request into Swift. And that started out as a uh, requirement or a, a desire from a colleague in, on the Glance project coming to, to us and saying, hey, this is something we'd, we'd like to better do, um, to have Glance as a service generated token and combine that with uh, the, the end users token. Um, it meant going and talking to uh, our, our collaborators in, on the Keystone project, and uh, they very kindly uh, put some support in for service tokens. And then we did our work on our end, on our Keystone auth middleware, and that all came together in the Kilo cycle. So. I think that's a really good example of uh, some good cross-project collaboration going on. And I know, Alistair, you're working on some pretty cool stuff right now that's not yet developed. So kind of I think the next question is, what are the things that are upcoming that uh, we haven't finished yet but uh, should be coming uh, later this year or next year in Swift? Well, I got or, or whenever they're ready. That's, I, I couch all of those, yeah, you know, whenever. We'll get them right. Yeah, done. there's a ton of great stuff. Um, uh, Alistair was talking about these times when you come to the, these sessions and you get to meet with people face to face, and Alistair is so great about that. I can kind of berate him. I think, ah, oh, this isn't going to work if we do it like this. And then, you know, we, we split up, and he goes back to England, and I go back to San Francisco, and then he pings me on IRC. So I've been thinking about that. And uh, actually, you're wrong. Uh, so we can do it like this. And uh, one of the things that he's working on that I'm really excited about is uh, improving uh, the way that we store metadata. Uh, it's kind of a first stepping stone uh, towards, uh, well, just some improving some performance characteristics and also sort of unifying the way that we handle metadata at the container and object levels. And um, that's going to be really exciting. Lots of other exciting stuff. 
You'll, you'll note that I travel across the Atlantic before I tell Clay that he's <laughs> wrong. Uh, so I, so uh, go, go oh, I was going to say, I got an, another cool feature that's, that's coming up, but there's a, uh, a fishbowl session on later this week. But I think everybody knows, if you're familiar with Swift at all, one of the cool architectural features is middleware, right, and the extensibility with middleware. In, in fact, if anybody caught Christian's talk in Paris, I think you, you go find it on YouTube. It was so cool. He basically wrote middleware for this session. That, <laughs> like during the session, wrote this little piece of middleware that did uh, thumbnail storing and retrieving. It was really cool. But um, there's a there's a spec right now that IBM has proposed that uh, we're going to start digging into later this week um, on storelets. And long story short, uh, it just really gives Swift the ability to uh, to more dynamically accept new pieces of middleware in different languages and run them in more secure ways and run them on proxy and object. And uh, I just encourage you to go take a look at the spec or come to the session later, because that's going to be uh, another really cool feature for Swift, along with another 12 things that are up there right now. Yeah, and one of the new pieces of work that's, uh, that's been started is um, uh, putting in place uh, encryption for data at rest. And uh, so while, while everyone's been kind of like really busy on erasure coding, uh, Janie Richling from IBM has been in stealth mode, moving that work along, which has been great. And I hope we see a lot more activity on that during the next cycle. I think we've already mentioned it. Um, I'm working on some container sharding. There's a proof of concept out there. There's a spec. There's going to be a work session on it later. Um, so that stuff's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, I think later on this week, we've also talked to some people with some kind of some tape backend stuff, which should be for colder storage and with perfect use for storage policies there. So yay, storage policies. <laughs> Uh, so another thing that I'm really excited about, and you know, we're really just getting this uh, started now. Uh, some uh, longtime Swift contributors at Rackspace have been working on a reimplementation of the Swift object server in Go to experiment with uh, some different sort of characteristics that you get in some different languages. Uh, a, a server that's mirroring network OI, a network I/O to disk I/O, uh, in trying to do a par efficient parallel I/O is a really good testing ground to, to sort of experiment with some of these things, and, and that's going to be happening during this development cycle on a feature branch. Uh, we're all currently sort of investigating that and looking into the the value that that's uh, going to generate. We're looking forward to Rackspace's leadership there. I see a few of them back there. So that'll be coming up too. Lots of exciting stuff going on. Yeah, I think there are a few more specs uh, that we are going to discuss at the end of the week, which are really interesting. Um, so, for example, we are also looking about um, external search, metadata search engines or notifications. And most, if not all, of these topics will be discussed at the end of the week. So if you're interested um, in contributing or helping out, um, please feel free, free, free to, to meet us there and discuss this stuff with us. So one thing that I really like about the community and kind of how we figure out what to work on and it's kind of come up with several of what you've said already is that a lot of the stuff that's worked on and a lot of the people who are getting involved are actually themselves responsible for production Swift clusters. Uh, if not directly, then, very, then uh, still very closely related to it because uh, maybe their customers are directly running those and they've still got to support that. Uh, the point is that uh, to a large degree, all of the requirements about what are we going to work on and how does this work and how do we make sure that it works better and do that comes from production clusters rather than just some R&D lab someplace. And I love that about this community. So I am curious about what might be one of your favorite production use cases that you've come across uh, where Swift is being used today. How about digital film tree, man? That I was love awesome. Gear that was awesome. There. Talk about that. That's that's a huge stuff. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, you know a lot of the a lot of times when people are talking about uh, what they're doing with um, OpenStack, very very often uh, they're coming up with OpenStack Swift. So, love to hear that. Yeah, film tree is a very good use case, I think. So, uh, so uh, I uh, would like to uh, introduce some uh, our company uh, production. Uh, so, uh, in our operation company, uh, we have developed uh, something, uh, maybe six or seven petabytes uh, cluster for uh, mail backup backend. So for backups? Yeah, mail cool. backups. Yeah. So uh, that really excited for me uh, because, uh, yeah, Swift can use for the production case, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think where Swift really shines is uh, when it comes to global replicated clusters. So as we saw with Digital Film Tree or with NTT or many other uh, customers as well, um, 
having the ability to store data in different um, locations and it's especially important for backups because you want to ensure that your data is not stored only on one side but also uh, for applications like file sharing or data sharing inside your company because it enables your company to keep the control over your data. You know where the data is stored, it's under your control, it's not somewhere, um, you know where it is stored and it's, that is really important to many, especially larger enterprises that have to, to keep uh, up with uh, regulations and so on. So and being in Germany yourself, that's something that's huge there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, um, yeah, I think that's, were you gonna share one too, Paul, or not? No, I can wait. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so, those, I, I kinda wanted to move on a little bit, so, okay, great, this is, we're, we're all great, we all love each other, and, and we all love Swift and everything, so let's, let's ask some of the, uh, some of the, the harder questions. Um, so right now in our community, what what are some of the challenges that face the community? What are we what are we fighting with that uh, we haven't yet solved, kind of community wise, and that we need to work on? We need to schedule our next hackathon, so we have to we have to get that done. Yeah, we're working on it. We've got two <laughs> fighting offers right now. So you'll see. Okay, so I, I think this is probably on everybody's minds is this plethora of work that we've got. A lot of just fantastic ideas. I've rattled off several more already, probably a million miles an hour, so I don't know if you can slow this down later and, and hear them. But you can go look at our specs, right? We've got, how many, anybody know the count? At least 10 or 12 specs I think or something like that? 12 or 13. And, and all of them are really interesting. So, you know, to be able to uh, pull off another miracle like what we've done with, with policies in EC, meaning gigantic projects without adding technical debt, without turning the code base upside down, without killing each other. Um, to be able to do that and pick the right ones uh, and continue to re repeat that process, I think is gonna be our biggest challenge. I mean, yeah, we have to admit that there, there is a finite bandwidth. Uh, I think there's some overhead of, of doing um, global collaboration. Uh, it, it, sometimes it is challenging. Poor Alistair staying up late at night so that we can you know, sync up in the mornings and stuff. Coda wakes up at 4 uh, in the yeah, morning Coda, on meetings. Uh, yeah, awesome. so there's definitely some overhead there, and um, yeah, I think we also need to manage uh, growth. You know, we're definitely trying to bring in uh, new contributors. There's uh, a few up on stage that haven't been uh, around as long, and we're really lucky to have them. Uh, you know, uh, so I, I think that is something that we need to keep an eye on, though. So how do we keep people engaged that have been around a long time, and how do we bring new people in so that we can sort of manage that uh, bandwidth growth. Uh, but the fact that it's open source, you know, we can have a uh, company like Intel working on storelets and they can kind of do that work parallel while other initiatives are being managed by, you know, other people where they have a tighter vested interest there. Yeah, and I just think as we, as we do that, as we uh, work on new features and uh, merge them in, you know, as we've said earlier, Swift is really stable. And, and I think the community has done a great job of um, making sure that is the case in the past and we uh, you know we're charged with making sure it stays the case as we go forward um, so I think maybe you know we need to think about our, you know our testing infrastructure some more too every time you have a new feature a new kind of storage policy and uh, there's questions there about are we are we covering that in our tests Is it every scenario every configuration possibility being covered in in testing so. That, that, that's a great point, Alistair. I think actually in this cycle we got to see a little bit more uh, leveraging the Swiss stack community cluster, uh, and we, we need to keep doing that. Uh, there's a, the Infra team has done an amazing job giving us a framework that we can plug in and bring in other testing equipment and other uh, running other scenarios off of Jenkins jobs that we have more control over, and we need to continue to, to build out on that. That's a great point. So where, uh, not in the community side, uh, what about on the feature side, on the, the technical side itself, what are, what's the biggest gap in Swift today? Surprise question. <laughs> it was, I told you about this yesterday. Uh, okay, so I'll throw one out there, which is, it is one of the specs we have, and I guess it's one I wrote, so. <laughs> um, so I think being able to, uh, make it easier for people to reconfigure the, the scaling. So we have this ring partition oh, power yeah, yeah. parameter in Swift that basically <laughs> oh, yeah, determines yeah. the scalability <laughs> of your cluster. And uh, so we have some ideas about how we can make that uh, something that can be uh, more easily changed. And I think that will really benefit operators and people that want to go and try out Swift, but then grow it uh, in scale. Is there, are there some things you want to specifically improve for operators who are running the clusters or end users who are actually consuming the storage? I mean, I guess that's a good example there. But yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that one's a great one, right? Like, 
from an ops kind of background. You know, it's like, it's like doing the Linux LVM thing, right? Like at the moment when you're setting up a Swift cluster, you tend to try and pick how big your cluster is going to be, and so you pick this part power. But to be able to start small and be able to raise it, if, this, if we can get the spec working, like automatically with live while, while Swift is up, that would be a big win for all ops. I mean, it makes life so much easier. I think that was a huge challenge when Swift was first open sourced uh, and first put into production. Like the initial use case was multi petabytes and you know multiple racks of gear and all this kind of stuff. And since then, over the last five years, we've continually tried to figure out, well, how do we do this with just three boxes, or how do we do this with just one rack of gear and things like that? In addition to continue to allow it to scale to you know thousands of servers and tens of thousands of hard drives. Yeah, I think there are a few well smaller issues that we need to fix. So um, one is uh, the increasement of uh, the ring partition power, and the other one is container sharding. These are things uh, we are going to, we are working on because we want to get out of the way, right? I mean, we want to make it as easy as, um, as possible for users and operators. They shouldn't be forced to think about things like this in advance. Um, I mean, if you're using other very popular object storages around the globe, um, you don't have to do that as well. So we should probably do the same and get out of the way of the users. And so last question before we kind of open it up to the audience. Uh, where, what do you want Swift to look like in three years? Where, I mean, like, kind of like a more than just, well, what are we going to do between now and Tokyo? But longer term, two, three, five years from now, what do you want Swift to look like? I want Swift, if you take all of the Swift deployments in the world and add them up globally, how many hard drives, how many bytes is actually being stored that were bigger than Amazon, bigger than S3? And maybe, that, maybe that's a five-year goal, but like, we're the open source thing. I think anybody uh, can come out there and put up Swift. And we, you know, in every, every data center, these, are, these should be the largest storage deployments that the uh, administrations are putting up. Uh, you're unifying storage across all the platforms. And Swift should be where it's all the, all the, all the bytes. Yeah, you know, and along those same lines, and, and this ties back to what we were saying earlier about working in this community, one of the really cool things is I think a lot of us take a lot of pride in things like the, the digital film tree presentation today or in Hong Kong, the, Mer, the Mercado Libre use case. So, I, you know, it's really cool to see stuff that we're working on out there in production, making a splash, and other people are proud of it, and we all have a piece of that. So I think where I'd like to see it in three years, I'd, I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more household name kind of stuff. Like, I think Ancestry's got a thing later this week, right, yeah. using Swift. I want to see that like just commonplace. Everyone, yep, Swift is there, Swift is there, Swift is there. So along those same lines, but I like, I like the publicity. It makes me feel proud to be part of this team. So, uh, I want. <laughs> did, did you know that the last uh, James Bond movie was partially used, uh, Swift was used to help do the special effects on that? I did not know that, thank you. <laughs> just me, so I, I want uh, more contributors and user in Asian time zone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the channel gets a bit lonely. It's like Australian and Japanese. Okay. Like we're, we're holding down the fort. So more Australians. Not that I don't think anyone's here who's a really Australian. Oh no, Michael. Come on, Australian. Come on, let's bring up our time zone. What about you, John? What do you want to see Swift? I mean, you're supposed to be thinking about this sort of stuff, so. <laughs> uh, so one thing I've said a lot of times, Clay, and you've told me I've said it too much, is uh, a, a very much along the lines of uh, some things that Clay and Paul said, is that my vision for Swift is that everybody will use Swift every day, even if they don't realize it. It's just like everybody, every day, everywhere. So if you're going to help your kids with homework, they're going to be using Swift to do that when you look up stuff on Wikipedia. If you're going to be watching movies um, and you're looking at stuff like Digital Film Tree and Comcast, streaming that many movies to you coming out of Swift, that's there. If you're playing games and you're downloading stuff uh, on the internet, it's, uh, that, that stuff is sourced and stored in Swift and delivered to you through, through other things. That's the kind of stuff is it being ubiquitous for, for the storage. Um, one thing I remember Clay said, uh, you know, probably over a lunch sometime uh, a few years ago, is just like, look, if you're storing data on the internet and you're not using Swift, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and so that's, that's the kind of thing. Yes, I want to see it go uh, more and more things. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm really excited about, and one of the things I really want to see in like a specific thing, is kind of the cool stuff that's coming along with new storage media. So we've seen things that... Um, 
uh, in the past several summits, uh, Seagate's been around talking about their new kinetic platforms, key value hard drive. Um, you've got other spinning media technology uh, like the SMR uh, drives that kind of are uh, a different way to, to go denser and you give you like 10, 12, 14, 20 terabyte hard drives. Um, that's pretty interesting. And then here this week, we've got a couple of different companies who have uh, already uh, released some code, some third-party ecosystem code that lets you uh, run Swift on top of tape libraries, and that's really cool. And then uh, we, there's also the whole world of Flash, and it's a whole new way to do things. And so what I want to see is that uh, natively, uh, when new storage media technologies are released and developed, that Swift is already supporting those and can take advantage of all the particular characteristics, everything from tape to, to flash. And so when we do that, that gives uh, the deployers flexibility, that uh, brings a lot of value to the end users who are actually doing stuff. And that's kind of what I'm really excited about uh, looking forward. So so I think we have a few, more, uh, a few minutes left, so I would love to answer your questions. What do you have questions for us as Swift things? Is there a uh, there's mic a over mic there? over here. Would you mind uh, coming you up? Use that. Yeah, hello. Oh, hello. Is that working? Is that oh, yeah. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Um, tail from the SKHMS San Jose. Um, my quick question is uh, for your daily walk um, when you write the code, um, in terms of testing, um, especially if you have to deal with some of the scalability issues, how do you test it? I mean, sometimes like a scalability matters, and then maybe it's the only that can that the same problem can happen only in some of the mass scale customer environment. Do you use some simulation environment, or you have to submit to the code to the end user, and then for them to validate? I just wonder how you uh, do uh, deal with that kind of scalability testing issue. That's that's really hard. I mean, there is some things that you don't necessarily uh, see until you are until you are running them at scale. And so, you know, being having that feedback loop with the uh, the operations team is is really important. But there's a few things that we can do, and and Swift can really leverage this with a lot of experience. You can you can kind of devise strategies that you that you are sort of known scalable approaches. Uh, Swift will often take the approach. Uh, I think in our design principles, we talk about leveraging the economies of scale. Uh, but the idea is uh, if you can do something like three times on a bunch of nodes, that's, that's the best way to do it. You know, like don't try to necessarily do a lot of coordination and bring everything in. Just, just make sure that the, the system is, is able to achieve the end goal, even if that means in sort of the failing degrading case that it's, it's duplicated work. Uh, and that, that's one of the strategies that you can employ to scale. Um, just avoiding contention, uh, trying to segregate things into you know, smaller blocks, you know, the, the reason that the, the, you know, we're looking at container sharding now is because there is this, you know, we're, we didn't want the containers to be a point of contention, so you make it so you can have as many containers as you want. There's no 100 bucket limit kind of thing. Uh, so being able to break up problems into smaller pieces uh, helps. Uh, but as far as, as testing, I mean, a lot of times it just takes uh, somebody that has a concern about a scalability of a specific component, bringing it into the lab and, and trying to, like you said, simulate it under uh, some serious load on a more constrained, you know, six or ten node environment, something like that. Okay. Or more, even. I think one of the things that's really cool is that we've got people in the community here up on stage and also uh, other people uh, in the community who are actually running very large clusters. And so uh, we can, we're not going to, one of the things that we're going to do is if you submit a patch that's going to have a question about that, we're not going to enable that by default for everybody. Um, so that allows somebody to put it into a lab that has a few hundred machines, even at you know, places like Rackspace and stuff like that, and they could actually test it and see what happens. Um, so that's really kind of cool, is being able to hear from people who are already running at very large scale and uh, let them kind of tune a knob and, and see what they think. Yeah. Thank you. Hi there, I'm, uh, this is Vishnu from uh, NetApp. So it, it's kind of a hard question, but just want to get your perspective. Uh, uh, you know, there, you have a bunch of vendors today who are building their own Swift implementations, and you have Ceph that's also implementing Swift. And you know, there's that whole API versus implementation, right? And, and you guys are just another, is our, another implementation, but also the reference API. And uh, I'm tr tr trying to understand what, what, what's your perspective on, on es especially given that the APIs could fork, right? And, and Ceph already is forking parts of it. So they have unique containers and you, know, you guys don't. So I'm just wondering what's your perspective on on implementation versus API, especially with commercial vendors and other OpenStack options? That's actually a really good question, something that does come up a lot. I'm actually kind of happy you brought it. I'm kind of sad and kind of 
happy that you asked that because it's one of the things that comes up a lot, you know, in the hallway tracks and conversations and kind of behind closed doors. So it's great to, to actually say something publicly about it. Um, I think there's two important things. My perspective has two components to it. One, absolutely firmly believe that uh, implementations matter. And just saying that an API is this uh, document someplace to describe something is not sufficient because the, the actual nuances of the API and how it's consumed and the performance and, and things like that matter just as much as the actual, what are the, what are the verbs and the, and the parameters and all that kind of stuff. But the second thing that I think is um, really important um, is that once you say that, okay, it's API and the implementation matters, it comes back to the whole reason behind OpenStack and to me, the, the important piece there is the open. Uh, and the fact that we have an established open design, development, governance model, all of that sort of thing put together. And that if something is done under that model, uh, then it is part of OpenStack. And so if somebody else is going out to re-implement an API in a different way, but they're not doing it as part of the, this, this community right here, all of us here in this room and all of this in this building uh, this week, um, then that, I, I can't really comment on that. I can't really have any real opinion on that because it's completely external to, uh, to what's going on. Um, if, it's not, if it's not brought to the community, then it can't really be treated as the community sort of thing. So um, I, I'm really happy that uh, people have found this and said, look, this is a really great way to do object storage. This is a really great way to talk to object storage and encouraging the development of applications and because that's what it's all about is people using and consuming the storage with applications is really important. And I'm really glad that people out there will help promote that. But absolutely, I strongly believe that the way you do that is in the open and the established way that that is done today is through OpenStack. And so apart from that, I would say, well, that's, that's, that's not OpenStack, that's not Swift, because it's a, it's a reimplementation of some part of the Swift API, but if you actually want to get involved and you want to make things better for everyone, then the way to do that is, is part of the OpenStack community. Does anyone have anything to add to, to John? I thought it was pretty eloquent. Okay. We talk about this kind of stuff a lot. I mean, we, we, like, we love, you know, more people that want to implement the Swift API, the, the better, you know, we think it's a pretty decent API. Okay, great, and, and a simpler question. What's the, the one big thing among the specs that you have that you think customers are asking for? Yeah. I think, um, I think uh, the encryption is something that is uh, a very popular topic. Uh, and a lot of times it's because that's something that's visible on the, on the uh, end user side. Um, so there's a lot of people, especially as uh, Swift is uh, getting deployed more and more with, uh, we've got several people here this week talking about storing genomics information, which is almost the definition of personally identifiable information. Uh, so they want to encrypt that kind of stuff, financial documents and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's probably the external facing most popular thing. Um, we were just flagged down. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, it's kind of um, uh, about the uh, way that Swift fits in with the overall OpenStack infrastructure um, in the face of the blurring of distinction between compute and storage. So when I'm thinking about things like, you know, the, um, uh, what's it called, the Lambda function type API for the other people have, and then there's also the, the, the uh, you know, somebody was talking about storelets and some of, you know, and, and, and where, where does that, how do you provision the compute that's sort of implicit to the storage? That, that, that's kind of the question. Zero VM's been working on that too. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have been looking at the, these large scale storage clusters and you know, they're busy working on their storage problems, but uh, I think people also want to apply compute to their data. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, maybe that, I don't, I think that right now there's, an, there people are really just, you know, like Swift is, is mainly a storage platform, so I think that what we're seeing with Storelets and Zero VM, these are, these are new kinds of experiments that people are kicking out, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about them. Uh, but I think for at least some time, they may be, you know, separate from the, the primary storage platform as people are sort of proving them out and figuring out how to scale them and what's the different sort of hardware characteristics that you want for these sort of compute and storage clusters. But I think it's, it's really important to sort of, for technology in general to, to leverage that. Yeah, and as, as I see more and more people uh, starting to use Swift in a bigger scale, uh, I think a, a phrase that was uh, bandied around a while back is, you know, that uh, scale demands specialization. 
so if somebody's going to say that, you know what, I've got an exabyte of data to store, generally you're not going to build that out on hardware that also can do a whole bunch of compute all at the same time. I mean, just like power-wise and cost-wise, marrying those together, that the, the hardware, you want to specialize on that to actually save some dollars. Um, and so what I see quite a bit of is people saying, look, I've got a storage problem, and this is a really good one, and it's going to be cheaper, and it's going to be easier to maintain, and easier to deploy and manage over time uh, and, and scale. Uh, so we're, that's why we're going to use Swift. And so that's what normally the kind of things that I hear are. But with uh, storage policies and new ideas for that's data right. migration, like, I mean, that's, it's all going to get unified. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And, and policies could easily be part of that provisioning answer as well, right? If, if there are concerns about compute utilization in the cluster, you could easily segregate the platforms that are dedicated for something like a storelet activity and, and often its own policy. I think we're out of time. So thank you very much for coming, uh, coming by. Uh, all of us will be around this week. Uh, feel free to grab any of us at any time to have any questions. Thanks. <laughs>